Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like the record show it is Monday, March the 22nd, and this is the Community Redevelopment Agency meeting. We will call this meeting to order. If I get Madam Clerk to read the roll, please. Call roll. David McGraw? Here. Gary Paytel? Here. Jeffrey Jones? Here. Francis Kowalski? Here. And Art Graham? Here. Okay, we're going to take a couple of things out of order on this agenda today. Um, we're going to skip over the minutes. Um, and we're going to go to uh, Chris. Okay. <laughs> Come on down. Yes, sir. Similar to 
what our purchasing and procurement department does for obtaining goods and services for the city. It would be the same process. But we suggest that we follow that process over a singular public auction, um, which would most likely limit the difference of the number of bids, the value that the CRA may obtain from the disposition of the sale. Um, and we would suggest that the CRA vote to approve for the city to commence that process. We would also bring it to the city council for city council approval to move forward with that. Because the way that the language is connected between the statutes and the bylaws, essentially, these are powers, the disposition of this property um, are essentially powers that are retained by the city to sell parcels in, the, in, that, in that area, in this area. So we would just seek um, city council approval to commence the process as well. So walk me through the competitive reward process. So it gets advertised in one of the papers. They have 30 days to submit a bid. Those bids are all private bids, or is that still public record? It's going to be public record. Okay. Um, but the chair, you, Mr. Chair, you could, you could not, you don't have to limit yourself to just 30 days. So I would, I would, you know, suggest extend the process a little longer. Um, to no, I'm just, I'm just trying to figure oh, out right. what the process is. Right, right, right. Yeah. So you said that you said a, a period of time, right. people submit bids. Submit bids. Those bids are all open to the public. Right. And then at the end of that specific time, somebody from the city decides which is the higher bid, and they select the higher bid. Right. And in this case, it, it appears if they're conforming to the solicitation document or the bid document, meaning they agree to all the conditions and limitations and restrictions, uh, we can do that by affidavit or um, a sworn document. They've submitted that. They've submitted the highest, most valuable bid for the CRA. They're the winner. They're compliant and responsive to the bid documents, and they're the highest, most valuable um, bid. And those restrictions that you have on there, is that some sort of deed restriction? We could, put it, we could put it as a deed restriction, but up front it would be um, in, the, in the bid documents so that any proposed, any um, proposer or bidder, they're on notice. If they don't agree with those, well, don't submit a bid. <laughs> but those are what you're on, you know, you as a potential purchaser, they are to be on notice. These are the conditions, restrictions, limitations. These will be placed in the deed um, regarding the actual conveyance. So if you are the prevailing bidder, you've agreed <coughs> to these conditions. So ultimately, it'll be drafted into a conveyance the document. Francis. Um, I just had a quick question. So we need to um, have this approved by us to then be approved by the city council before we can put the property we've been talking about on the south end up for sale. Right, in the competitive award process. Yeah. Okay. And that's because we didn't have anything in our current documents for sale, only purchasing. Right, right. That's right. There, in our current by in the CRA's current bylaws, there isn't anything in regard to sale sale of property or parcels. Um, but the one thing that it does say is it actually references in Article 12, Section 1, one of the two statutes that we would be Florida statutes that we'd be traveling under to sell this property is 163.358 which I gave you. In bylaws, Article 12, Section 1, it discusses that all actions proposed to be taken by the agency, which are or may be subject to the jurisdiction of the city under 163.358, would require prior action approval by the city council. Right. So the reason I'm asking is that I've been approached by some people who have been at least one specific builder who <coughs> Um, 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm just contemplating the different departments that are involved in this. So, you know, myself, finance, purchase and procurement as a subdivision of finance, actually department. Um, I would say likely we would have it on the streets, meaning it would be out to the public to view and begin their bidding process probably 60 days. I think we might be able to do that. Um, but more likely, more like three. Yeah. More than likely. Yeah. Because we still have to go through council. Yeah, <clears throat> it would have to go to council, um, set for a council meeting, which at this point would have to be in April. So most likely the second session, city council meeting in April. But I could begin work on it in anticipation of city council's approval. So I don't, I wouldn't just stall and wait until that, that city council meeting and then begin day one of the preparation so I would be working on it <clears throat> you know, Mike and I would talk actually we listen to the CRA vote yeah, you know. yeah. And, and I realize that there may be particular parties developers private individuals that are interested in this property already they've made it known that they're interested in purchasing this and that's fine and good um, but if you were to follow what our suggestions are they're going to be in the competitive pool and that's what's in the public I'm trying to figure out why it should be public record as it is come in and rather than, rather than that after the fact when the bid is determined which one's the highest. Oh, I'm sorry. So they're, they only become public record only after a certain time, after the closing period. Okay. Yes, yes, sir. Sorry. Didn't mean to confuse you there. So it, that was fun on that one. Okay, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, absolutely. So similar to other procurements, um, that the city may engage in where they're requesting the submissions of bids and proposals, those do not become public record during that process. It's only after the decision is made that those bids and proposals that were submitted, they become public record. There is a public records law that applies to it. We'd be glad to send it to all the board members um, tomorrow. And where do the, where do the um, proceeds of the sale go? So the way that we've contemplated it so far, if we understand, it's, it's a little bit different from, uh, for example, what the, the five parcels that we're calling the Sunshine Court parcels, where those apparently are city owned, um, but initially purchased with CRA monies. This is, uh, Horn parcel is CRA owned, but going to be, uh, the sale and disposition of it is predominantly gonna be handled by city staff. So in terms of the proceeds, um, <clears throat> the proceeds will go back to the CRA and Ashley's department will help you with those. Then there's a little sub part to this, which is the bylaw, the CRA bylaws contemplate, and again, this is in article 12, now this is section two, in C, it says that all purchasing services <coughs> will be done through the city's purchasing department. So those are services that the city according to the bylaws, seems to be obligated to perform. However, we're not doing a purchasing, but we're doing sales. So I really need to talk to Sherry further about, and we discussed, we started to discuss it just the, later this afternoon after we met with Jim, but Sherry seems to believe that a portion of the proceeds would go, would be re returned from the, from the CRA to the city to help cover the extra costs that are associated with putting together the documents, um, so perhaps some fees that Sherry may incur as an outside legal consultant to guide this through the process. Um, so we're not exactly sure on that yet. So there may be a small portion that may have to go to the city just to cover the costs for staff to handle this process and to draft these documents. Again, like I said, it's probably gonna involve myself, Sherry, and probably Lewis from our purchasing department um, and perhaps the costs of, associated with the advertising and the publication of the bid. Um, but otherwise it's predominantly in the CRA. CRA money is coming back to you. Any further questions to Chris on this issue? Okay. Um, so you just need for us to decide that we want to move forward and then we're done? Right, I would suggest that tonight, because the CRA did publicly notice this item, um, the public is aware and notice of the, the item and that you, you are permitted to vote. And I, you, know, you may frame the, the, 
to vote any way you wish, but I would suggest that the, the questions to vote on are um, the method to, well, to ask the city staff to move forward and ask the city council to move forward with approving, and two, what method would you like to use, the competitive bid process or the public auction? You have either option available. Um, I think those would pretty much be the two motions to submit for your vote tonight. I got a question for Jim. If we were, for the last couple of weeks, I guess a couple of months, we've been trying to deal with the surplus that we have to return back to the city of Jacksonville, does this add to that surplus? I would throw that to Ashley, but I don't think so. It does? <coughs> I have to go to the CFO for the city. To answer your question, these funds would return to the staff that and tip, and so at the end of the year, it would be calculated as part of the annual fund balance. So it would kind of, if we have funds on hand, it would be part of those that are returned to both the city of Jacksonville Beach and the city of Jacksonville. Well, then I throw the question out to you guys, and I'm not trying to derail this thing by any means, but is this the time that we want to get rid of this property if it's just going to basically the proceeds just go across the ditch. I guess my feeling is that uh, we've waited this long for the sale of the property rather than giving up those proceeds. Um, it, it, it kind of gets rolled into a bigger question that we have also. City Council has put before us the effort to put forth a plan for the South District and we need to get that plan put together. And until we have that plan, I don't think we're ready to uh, to release the funds. I know City Council doesn't want to release it until we have really examined them. They've given us 12 months to do that. And I would suggest that we get the plan done and figure out the direction we want to go. And at that point, make the decision in reference to the dis um, distribution or dis disposal of this property.
sale time and it takes a while to close, we're in we're past October first. Right, and when those other five lots are sold before the horn lot, well, a matter of supply and demand. Those are five less lots that are available to be purchased, and now you have horn, which is really high on the pedestal because it's one of the very few available remaining lots. <coughs> Can we find, can we make a motion to start the process in August? Or is that, I mean, like, what can we do to make sure that the end of our bidding is October 1st, so no matter what the sale is after October 1st? The easiest thing to do is just table this thing for 90 days. That's the easiest way to do okay. And decide what we want to do then. I wouldn't mind more information about the two different kinds of processes so I can actually Dive into the two. Okay. Hold on a second, Gary. Mr. Chairman, the thing I would recommend that we do is we put it on hold until such time we have a plan for the South District. And we, at that time, we lease that property for sale. It, it, to me, it feels like we, we've got to get our arms around what we want to do in the South Beach District. And then I think we'd be in a comfortable position to go ahead and make the decision on, the, on that piece of property. Well, then I can simply, as chair, just defer this. I don't have to put a date on it, and I guess at any point we can bring back up the whole business. So we'll defer it. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you for putting me forward, Mr. Chairman. I realize you've got to go next door to the city council. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And I will get to all the board members a uh, brief description of the two processes, public auction versus the competitive bid award. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Trevor, come on down. Good evening, Trevor Hughes, Superintendent of Parks and Recreation. Um, as we met at the workshop last week, and we discussed uh, replacing the playground at Sunshine Park, we've asked if we could bring in a professional in the field of playgrounds to, to give a little presentation. So I'd like to introduce Stacy Mosley with Compan, and she'll do our presentation. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. Members of the CRA, I'm Stacey Mosley, and yes, I am with a company called Compan. It's actually a Danish word that means companion. And now, is someone going to start? Aha! Uh -huh. um, I was brought into this conversation a few months ago to sort of think about Sunshine Park. There's a new future ahead of it, and I think a lot of people are wondering what can that future look like, what's good for the community, what's good for the children, what's good for the playground. Um, This is uh, some, just a few pictures of Sunshine Park today. Um, we all know what it looks like. It's dearly loved. I've take, I took my children there. I, I know many, many people have taken their children there, and their children's children have gone there. It's iconic, not only for North Florida, but really for even wider than North Florida. People come from southern Georgia. It is known in Florida as being one of the best playgrounds in the state. And I think we really want to appreciate that. But I think also now, can we advance one, please? This is looking at it from above. It's a big piece of property. Um, it is a great opportunity for you all just to think about what the future could hold for this playground. Um, right now, advance one, please. You have a playground designed by a company called Leathers. Mark Leathers is a man who lives in upstate New York. 
I really think he went through Florida about 20 years ago and built probably 25 of these playgrounds. I see them often in my career with Compan. Um, the town of Orange Park has just pulled their old leather's playground down. And this actually gave us an interesting set of pretty current statistics data. Um, and Leathers proposed to build a new one for the town of Orange Park. So they proposed to come in as turnkey contractors. Their total turnkey cost was close to 700000 I will point out that this was not for a, a surface that an industry would call port in place, which the acronym is PIP. It's a unitary surface that's very wheelchair accessible, wheelchair friendly. The surface for this playground was mulch, which we call engineered wood fiber, acronym EWF. So this was a mulch surface for about 700,000. They had about a five month window on um, you know, the not to construction completed. I will say that they no longer build in wood. They're, all their fabrication now is a plasticized wood and their, their design hasn't really changed much. They're known for this fort, kind of a post and platform structure, which is what you all have. And again, what you all have had in, for the past 20 years has been fantastic. Um, but there are some issues with this type of leather structure. Um, lack of visibility. If you're a parent somewhere in a playground, it's very easy to kind of lose your child in that maze of post and flat platform, very similar to the one you have now. Um, it's not exactly what I call wheelchair friendly. They put ramps on their playground so a child can go up a ramp, but there's not a lot of low level play, not a lot of interactive manipulative play, not a lot of sensory play. It's pretty static. Again, you can walk up, cross platforms, and slide down. But people do love these. There's a lot of emotion involved in a leather structure. Um, the town of Orange Park just chose to tear their sound and they did not come back with another. But I just thought this is a good comparable. This is what you all have now. You can't rebuild what you have now because they're not using that type of pressurized wood anymore. They're only using plastic. But their, their icon, their graphic design, the thing they're famous for, this tower, fort-like structure, they're still doing it. Ma'am, I don't mean to cut you off, but we need to pick this up a little bit. Uh, my yeah. understanding is you're just going to tell us about what's new that we have not seen. Okay, I just wanted to make sure we address this because I know there's a lot of sentimentality based on this playground, but I'm ready to roll. Hit me, please. So y'all are going to need to think about four things, in my opinion. You're going to need to think about timing, your tactical considerations, what kind of concepts you might want to move forward with in budgets. Next slide, next click, please. Oh, great. When you're timing, and this, I'll make this very quick. Um, the, on the top, you've got what you can, the timing strike, the, that would be your timeline if you purchase on a contract. U.S. Communities is the contract the city uses. If you decide to go out to bid, you're looking at a much longer timeline. So you can roughly have a playground maybe like somewhere between Thanksgiving and Christmas if you purchase on a contract. If you decide to go out to bid, you're going to be looking at probably the summer-ish of 2022. So you need to keep that in mind. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. So tactical considerations, I think because there's so much sentimentality behind this playground, you want to try to keep your center gazebo. I would suggest you keep your outside wall, your parameters. I would suggest you keep your shades. They're in good condition. Definitely keep your entry. And use all those things as a salute to the past while you're still embracing the future. What gets demolished, you've got interior walls that do nothing but divide your space. You've got all your equipment. It's no longer compliant. It is not ADA accessible. It's not ADA friendly. And you couldn't really replace it that way anyway. I say, let's go ahead and get rid of all of it while holding on to what could be a real salute to the past and what this playground has been to you guys. Two new concepts. These are just ideas. They're not fully fleshed out. But just dial back the leathers for a minute and think about what this opportunity could be for this new space. And just for an example, the first design I'm going to address is a wood design. I'm also going to address the steel design. Both really good for salt air. This is an overview now. All the little gray areas around are what we call fall zones. And I've left those on. Think that's, your, that's going to be your surface off there to the right. So I wanted you to see the fall zones. So when you look at the equipment, you realize it may look spaced out, but all that takes into consideration how far it actually needs to be away from the other piece in order to be compliant. In this first design, I'm suggesting you might want to consider another ship. I would not go with a pressurized treated ship. This ship is made out of a wood called Robinia, which we've been using in Europe for about 20 years. It's also the same what you see in the 
In the fences at Jamestown, it's a very, very hard wood that is not at all conducive to being exposed by moisture or bugs. It, it's almost weathers like steel. But I thought, why not just go with another big ship? And let's add a parkour so kids can probably, let's link this functionally to the ship so kids can, they're running across, they're climbing, they're in, they're out, there's low level, there's upper level, it's massive, lots of kids on it. This thing in the middle is called a supernova, so this is spinning like eddying water around the ship. If you're functionally linked to this parkour, now you're getting into sort of a ninja parkour, which older kids, tweens and teens, really, really love. We're moving around now. This is an upper view. You can see there's not only imaginary play, but a lot of cross-body coordination, core strength, problem solving, and it's completely accessible if you have a child in a, in a you know, a mobility device, they're inside, they're underneath, they're with the other kids while they're playing. It is not ramped, but there's a lot of accessibility for a child who might be in a mobility device. And this whole surface is unitary. What you all have now, but much better, spongier, more impact resistant. That's just another view. We're moving around quickly. I would suggest that maybe we do, rather than wooden uh, swings here, you might want to think of stainless, stainless steel, or hot to galvanize, excuse me, with stainless steel fasteners much better with the air. A big old swing bay that's designed to fit under your existing shape because you would want to keep that. And moving around now, this would be your two to five area, which you could, you could really identify it rather than an awkward wooden fence inside, identify it with a pip design. Your port in place could be a different color, which gives you a visual unifying area for your little guys. And I try to, in this design, keep as many of your play value moments in, for your two to five children that they currently have. So there's jumpy bridges, there's tunnels, a lot of the things that are currently in your design. Staying with your ship theme, there's a little ship for your little guys. There's rockers here, ocean rockers that can, parents can be on with their children engaged. There's a, a wheelchair accessible spinner here that a child literally can roll right into if they're in a mobility device. And again, the whole idea is inclusion. Children of all abilities can play together at their own level. And there's great sight lines for parents. This is just an idea. An overview. This is a second idea in, in the spirit of clipping this along. Again, you can see that um, the gray areas are your fall zones. All this equipment just nestles in beautifully around your existing shelter and the outside fencing would all stay in place. This is going to be a bigger leap for you guys. Frankly, this is a great piece. Um, it's called the Giant. And this, in particular, this particular one is called the Ocean Giant. So it's got impressions on these quarter inch, or, excuse me, three quarter inch Lexar panels and there's stainless steel panels. It's 29 feet tall. There hasn't been one built in the Southeast. So it would raise you back up to the iconic status that your original Sunshine Playground had. Uh, low level play down through here, super high upper level play. You'd be able to probably see this from JTB. And uh, you know, keeping with the ocean theme, it's, it's fun, it's kind of fresh. And you can see up close, these panels right now have sea themes on them, but you could also customize them. If you wanted to say Sunshine Park, or if you wanted to say City of Jacksonville Beach. And moving from the giant, again, a supernova, because there's so much fun, and if you've never been on one, you have to. This little thing, I can't even tell you how much fun it is. It looks very innocuous. It's so much fun. You get three or four kids on it, and they're all trying to pull it over. So again, teamwork, core strength, upper body, lower body, risk-taking, really big, important part of play. And we would probably, fun I would try to find a way to functionally link this, but if I couldn't do that, then this would be another parkour experience, this ninja type thing, all ropes, all core cord rope. The more kids you get on it, the more it's wiggling around, the more fun it is. Galvanized poles here, galvanized on your swings. And going over here, I probably would stay with galvanized on your baby swings as well, your two to five area. And you can see looking down on the two to five area, they look like little hip squeaks. All that looks so tiny. This is your two to five area. And I'm keeping, again, with the theme, this is Mermaid, The Little Mermaid, The Ugly Duckling, based on the Hans Christian Andersen stories. You've got a net in the middle, smaller ropes for little hands to grab, low level little hidey places where they can tuck in but their parents can still see them, manipulatives, a stainless steel sliding mark, but everything on a lower scale for these children. And again, we're working with the port in place, it's a different color, so it identifies the space. This inclusive spinner is lime green. Again, a child can roll in, 
be part of this play, roll over here in the mobility device and spin with other children. Go spinner, another spinner. This is a balance beam because I know the children out at the playground just love that balance beam. So again, two very, very different ideas and hopefully just keeping this high level. My hope is just for you to open up to the fact that there's, this playground can be many, many different things. You've got the space, you're going to have the budget, and estimated budgets for this with the Rovinia ship all in, are, we're estimating about 720. That includes all the demo, that includes the surface, the equipment, the install, the freight. On the second option, the ocean, about 702. So pretty close in price. The port in place tends to be a consistent price. Other things shift up and down. The equipment's a little more, the install's a little less, the freight's a little less. But that's where you are. And again, I appreciate the time you've given me this afternoon. I know this is a big, big thing for everybody, a big conversation with lots of considerations. And I hope this conversation has just opened you up just to maybe some more questions. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions? Oh, one last thing. This was our compressed estimated timeline, if it was purchased on a contract and not to go out to bid. Here. Any questions? Yeah, just one question. It just didn't seem like there was a, a lot of pieces there, and so I'm curious as to how many people or kids can uh, use it at one time. Well, we do uh, capacity evaluations on all of our different pieces of equipment. And you're absolutely right, the park is always packed with a ton of people. But if you notice, they're sort of grouped in one pod here, one pod there. I think you'd see more moving around going from activity to activity to activity in a design like this, rather than one big massive structure. It'd be moving around. And we could drill right down and do capacity studies all day long on how many kids on each piece. And that's my answer for you. Lots. Any other questions? I think we're good. Thank okay. You. Thank you all very much. Have a nice evening. Michelle and Sherry, come on down. For the next contestants. Yes. If you would please state your name and address for the record. Yeah, Sherry Nicholson, 13721 Hunter Wood Road, Jacks, Florida. Michelle Tipton, 2333 Azalea Drive, Jacks Beach. So we wanted to give you our view. I know you want to hear our view, of course. Yeah. So anyhow, what we think is the idea of taking a playground that's 20 years old and actually looking at putting the gift of what the island is all about in something 20 years going forward is a plus in everybody's favor. Things have changed, children's needs have changed. We have a lot more innovative educational ideas for sensory and everything else that goes along with children. There needs to be a lot more available to children with special needs, not just in wheelchairs, other needs. And that was the one thing that 20 years ago, all we knew was that we needed to get a wheelchair on a ramp. We didn't take in the consideration with what we had available at the time, all the other factors that would play out, nor did we look at the possibility would it be better to have more area for a younger child versus where the older children could play and not trying to pack everybody in so we're excited about going forward i do understand it's probably in the best interest for everybody that in order to go forward we don't try to pull so much of bringing the community into this particular um, project because it will go forever um, we want to see it go forward, and we would love for you all to look at the innovation of making this playground, how wonderful it was 20 years, let's bump it up and get another 20 year plus with it. But if we don't do what we currently have there, we need to get community input, so then we will have community meetings. But not to the degree that we had to do for two plus three years to no, I mean, we'll probably have two meetings and, you know, we'll, you know, in 30 days, 60 days, we'll be able to knock it out, but it is just, you know, if, if we don't, if we don't give them back what they exactly had to, we'll go back out to them again. I understand that. Okay. Just the fact that you're all taking time to see this go through means a lot to everybody. So, I really appreciate it. Any questions of Sherry or Michelle? Jeff? I'm just curious, what did you think of what we just saw? Um, 
I like the idea of the innovation because I know that things are moving forward. I noticed that there was a lot of the art view of it. Um, there's a lot of visual, that's a big one. Um, I'd really have to do a lot more research personally to see, does that stand up for all the needs that we have? It's a lot more open than our playground we have right now. You brought it out. I saw that instantly. It's a lot more spread out. Um, I have to do more research, but I do understand. To answer your question, we need something that stands for what we need today, not what we had 20 years ago. So. Well, and I'd like to also add, I appreciate your comment of capacity because yeah. we have an incredible amount of people that visit it regularly, and I'm not sure what the capacity of that is because what we have is filled often. I, I do like the idea of us being able to utilize technologies that have gained in the last 20 years, but also continue with the concepts of the history. There's so many little pieces of the beach that are represented in the current project that I think our community would support seeing a, a surrounding of beaches history and beaches artifacts and beaches um, commemoratives as part of the new project. So, you know, a new and improved with the technologies, you know, whether it's something like that, um, you know, there's pros and cons to the openness and the corrals and the spindles of what the currents are. So I think we're in a good step. We do 100% support what you're doing and wanting it to be planned, but don't want it to get so bogged down that we miss, yeah, that it doesn't happen. Um, we understand that. So we want to support you in that direction, whatever we can do community-wise. Yeah. I just want to make one observation that the new designs and the comment you just made, the wide open approach I don't think it works. I actively use this park with my 18 month and uh, keeping the kids that are flying around away from her is good for safety because there's two different speeds going on in this playground. So I think it works excellent right now having the area separate. separate. Yeah, that's a good point. Francis. I'm going to admit that because I don't go as often, but there were some things, there's no disrespect when I say this, there were some things that in that presentation that actually kind of bugged me wrong. Because when I was there, the way it's designed now with the separation, a parent sits by the entranceway, their kids are safe, they're never leaving that space, you know where they are, you don't have to see them all the time. And kids don't need hover parents, and I think if we create an environment where we have hover parents, they're not going to expand in their, their growth, in my personal opinion. They are safe because they're completely enclosed, and the parent literally can sit by the gate and know if their child leaves. I personally don't like the things that are presented to us. I understand that we may need to consider some other ADA stuff that we can maybe incorporate and maybe some more sensory to what we currently have. But um, I would like to know what compliance things we must have to incorporate in this because me and my personal opinion, I hated everything I saw. I'm sorry. This is why the community meetings are going to be so valuable because, again, we're speaking, parents are speaking. These are the, I get it, I get it. Let's just keep moving forward. Yeah. I'm all for it. It's um, interesting to get the comments back. I did an informal survey in my community, which is Ocean K. A lot of the parents take their kids over to the uh, to the park, and a number of the items that you brought up are exactly their concerns: visibility, the fact that they can't keep their eye on both the entrances coming and going, and whether or not their kids are going to get in and out, the ADA criteria. But the one that really surprised me, <laughs> hands down, um, what the what the parents wanted was the composite wood. They were not interested in um, in the more metal uh, type features. They were, they were looking for something that had a more up-to-date theme and so forth to it, but more in the wood composition. And again, this was an informal survey, and you know, I probably got back about 20 responses, but they were very specific about what they were looking for and what they were wanting. I, I do think there's a lot to be said from the point of the time that it was invested in. And we look at regional, southeast, it worked, you know. It was very successful and it's kind of of the why we create the wheel. How do we innovate what we have 
and it's it's been successful. They liked it. They like it today. They liked it 20 years ago. So let's let's be creative in the new materials and what we can do. Yeah. Like just when you mentioned that um, preference for composite wood, steel in you know, Florida summer with sun beating on it gets hot. I would think. I just would think that would be a very important consideration. That's why we use tracks as well. That's actually the particle we use at the time is tracks. No. Which, again. And, and if I may, I just to compliment your comment, our community redid its playground. We spent about $60,000 taking down an old wood structure and putting back basically a metal um, playground system. And. Uh, that's exactly one of the complaints that came back is that our own playground, you can't get out there in the middle of summer because there's no shade over the top of it. And so it gets awful hot, the metal itself, and difficult for the kids to play on. So they'll end up at Sunshine Park. <laughs> there you go. We got this. Ladies, thank you very much thank for coming you very back. Much. Thank you for your time. Ken? Ken Marsh, 2011, Yale Avenue. I'll try to keep this brief because I don't want to repeat everything that everybody else has talked about. I came in here, I guess a month ago, talking about uh, that I was in favor of a complete replacement as is. But in the last CRA meeting where we talked about a better, perhaps a better mousetrap, I was open to that. Um, I'm still open to it. Um, Jeff, your question about how I thought about that. Uh, I like the natural softness of wood. But I do think there's technology that we can improve upon. I agree with the comments about safety there. And uh, I lose sight of my grandkids saying I use it by two or three times a week. The siding is not great, and the two entrances aren't great. So there's improvements that can be made. And I think it's worthwhile to look at what, how to use this. One of the questions uh, that I think this group has to answer is, can you replace it as is? Because we heard Stacy say nobody does that anymore. So if nobody does that, replacing as is may be a moot point, and we have to look at some other alternatives. As far as being expeditious, I agree with everybody here. But we have to remember that just a few months ago, we were looking at 2024 for this playground. Okay, so I think moving ahead and doing this thing right, taking it better than what we have and, and understanding how the community feels. Just put me down as one that likes the softness of the natural wood and not so much of the colors. I call it kind of a Ronald McDonald kind of look. I'm not in favor of that. But again, I'm just one of many. So I do think getting community input is valuable. So I do thank this group for being uh, putting this on the agenda, trying to push it through. I hope you kind of look at how we can take what we've got and just make it better for the future. Thank you. Hold on David. I just want to get clarification. Did, uh, I, I thought I heard Stacy said that company doesn't use that material. Right. Not that that material is never used anymore. Leathers no longer uses wood, and I don't know of any other company that does. They use a, a plasticized wood. Okay. Thanks. Trevor. You want me to close it out, or you got questions for me? Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I think we got a lot of the one. The one question that we asked you last week was: Is, is can we replace what we currently have? I think from from here on, the responses. And again, kind of like to, to echo what, what Kenneth said. This is something that originally was was um, thought about a couple more years. We have really fast tracked this. I think this gives us some more valuable information. And it gives us the ability to put our heads together a little bit more and to get back with you as quick as possible to present something that, that works for everybody. Uh, I, I think that we can do that. Was that a yes or no? <laughs> We're going to do some more research. Um, obviously, le Leathers doesn't make it in wood. Uh, we have not contacted Leathers. Uh, we'll continue to, to look and we'll bring something back to you as quickly as possible so we can move forward as quickly as we can. Well, I, I have to agree with Francis, and and I was not enthused by the things that I saw there. I I also one of the guys that liked the wood product. 
And so that there can't be just general woods and some sort of uh, um, man-made wood. Um, but I, I, it's just one of those things where I liked it 20 years ago, and I, I still like it today. I actually went by there today and looked at it, and there's still a bunch of kids around playing on it. Right. And you know, the fact that you can build playground wood that lasts for 20 years and is still lasting says a lot. No, again, I think this is a, a lot of valuable information, and it's, a, it's been valuable for us as a Parks and Recreation staff, and we'll continue to work on the plane, and we'll be back to you soon. Hold on a second, David. Okay. Uh, if, if we replace the structure exactly as it is with a different material, does that have to then go to So the, it, it can't be exactly because it doesn't meet current standards. So there will be some tweaks. And so if we were to reach out to a letters or were to reach out to another company, there will have to be some slight redesigns. So there's no exact. But we so so we can reach out, find someone that does something similar, talk about the issues, the sight line issues, some of the other safety issues, make sure it's current compliant, and then we can do that. So since this plan is changing no matter what, we're gonna be going through the public process anyways, right? Yes, I think we need to. Francis. Trust me, I don't want to. <laughs> I only heard that there is a wheelchair ramp out there that they can get up to. Nothing that was presented to us today provided us with the things that we could utilize in our current park to make our current standards meet our compliance needs. I thought last meeting we made it very clear. We like our park. We want to know how to make it better with a new stuff. I'm sorry to make hard line about it. That park is known for that wood structure. We have a gazillion of parks in this Jacksonville area that are going to be focused on. All those great ideas can go somewhere else. So I feel very underwhelmed because I only got, there's a wheelchair that you can add that does the same thing. That's all we got for sensory stuff for the ground level. To me personally, I'm very, very, very big on kids need to be kids. Parents can sit by the doors. The doors are just fine. They're fine, perfectly fine there. There is no thing that they're horrible entrances. They're really not. So I just don't feel like I got what I expected in this meeting because I thought we were going to get ideas to decide what we were going to add on if we decided to. So in the next meeting, I say all that, I'm genuinely asking, can we get some ideas of what we are missing for compliance purposes that we need to incorporate? That's what I really would like to get my hands on. So specifically, you need to go out to what we currently have there and figure out what needs to happen to make that all ADA compliant. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the other question is, can you get that in some sort of, can you get it done by somebody else and wood? And if not wood, then some kind of composite material. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get samples and um, we'll be back. Well, hold on a second. That, that's what Francis was saying. I need to make sure that at least one other person agrees with that. <laughs> so, you know, okay. oh, let me go back, Francis, because at the last meeting, Everybody wanted just the same thing that was out there. That was except for myself. Right. And I wanted to see what else was out in the marketplace. Jeff finally concurred in reference to that. We weren't saying that they had to bring back a design. All we were asking for was what's out there in the marketplace? What else, you know, do we need to get educated on to require Trevor to have come here with a design is not, was not the intent. I think now that he's got some input, I think he can go back to the drawing table and they can start to put together a scheme and uh, something that really works for that part, taking into account everybody's comments up here as well as the public's comments and my informal uh, survey that I did. I think now you have the information to truly go back and do what, what you need to do. And hopefully we can all do this together in a very expeditious manner so that we have something that uh, hopefully next year will be there for the kids. Because I know I'm out there every weekend with my granddaughter and that park desperately needs help because there's a lot of pieces that are starting to fall apart. And uh, it won't be long before some kids hurt because it hasn't been repaired at this point. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't come across out of the meeting last time that we were 
considering an upgrade. It was either can we tear it down and replace it with the same thing, or if we can't, what are some other options? I didn't ever think we were going to just try to tweak it, um, add this, that, or the other. It was always a tear down and rebuild in my mind. So I guess I remember things a little different than you, Francis. Yes, go ahead. So I'll just respond to both of you about being confrontational. Yes, we talked about replacing it as is or not. The problem is, is no matter what, if there was some adjustments to our compliance purposes, we would have been forced to change them without having to change design. So that is the tweaking I'm talking about. I want to know times change, compliance changes, just like with our our, um, our um, overpasses over the dunes, like our cap. So those things do change. So in my opinion, when we left, it was exactly as it is, as long as it's compliant. That's how I took it. So I was hoping they would show us things that would make it compliant the way it is now. So that's what I'm going to try adjustments. But still a rebuild. A rebuild completely okay. Okay. with those adjustments for compliance purposes. Okay. Quick question. Um, would we be able to add one of those uh, wheelchair accessible spinners today? Just get that installed like the like that. I mean, I'd rather, not, I'd rather not put it within the footprint that we're talking about rebuilding. I mean, even even if we were to demolish exactly what's there, it would build exactly what's there. We still have to pour out, tear out all the pour in place, tear out the sure. timbers. I so, was really just asking that for you know, kind of how we go about this because if we could just use the exact same design as is and add. And that may be room to expand outside the gates and move the perimeter a little bit further than, than what it does. We, you know, that could be something that we look into, finding something that closely replicates what we have and then expand to it a little bit further. But no, I, I appreciate the information. I think we, we gather a, a ton of information. It gives us the ability to go back and, and keep digging and, and we will push and, and move forward. This is something that we plan to, to have done as quickly as possible. Now, do you need to have some sort of, do you guys have all the ADA compliance or do you need to bring some compliance officer out to look at it? And, how do you go about getting So we will. So we'll contact the, the professionals that, that would build that structure, and that's something that, that they would be able to speak on, okay. for sure. And you'll have that for us next meeting? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And our CAPE officer has not come in. No. Um, Sure. No, this is kind of old business, but it goes along with Kate. Um, I brought it up at our workshop, uh, and we didn't get around to uh, having this conversation, but I think we need to have somebody um, take a closer look at parking on First Street, particularly in the area of um, Fifth Avenue North and Seventh Avenue North. There's quite a bit of of trucks that are parking on First Street. Um, to the point where there are several of them at one time parked on First Street, in this case going north, forcing everybody into the one lane that's left, that's a southbound lane. Um, along with that, unfortunately, the Margaritaville, a couple of times a week, they roll their dumpsters out onto to the street edge, which puts them on the sidewalk itself forcing people to kind of walk into the loading dock area to get around them and then continue on the sidewalk. And I think that needs to change. The, number one, the smells from that garbage, and they sit there all day. They, they're not there just for a short period of time when a truck comes to pick them up. I've gone by there numerous times, and they sit there all day on the sidewalk. And if that's one of our main pedestrian thoroughfares in this city. It's not a very um, inviting walk to go by that loading dock area with those smelly dumpsters sitting there all day out on at the street edge. So I, I don't know if um, you know Kate, you know, could take a little closer look at that and have some conversations with um, Margaritaville, but I think something ought to be um, done as it relates to that issue. Dennis Perry, Director of Public Works. I will address your garbage concerns. Um, Margaritaville, in their uh, um, process to get open, 
um, didn't understand the timeline. They had a nice big box drawn on their design that said solid waste removal. That was it until a week before they were ready to open. They had no idea how they were going to handle the garbage. So we began by bringing them two dumpsters, and that's all they wanted. And we told them that's not near enough. And they began to go through the process. They have ordered a compactor that will be inside there, and then they will organize their uh, removal and replacement of that compactor um, unit as they need to be filled up. The issue is that compactor, until it gets designed, built, drawn, and installed, we have to deal with the four dumpsters going onto the sidewalk. It's our requirement that they have to have them pushed out to the sidewalk to where the truck can get them. They have no other choice. Um, there isn't a provision in our contract for the driver to come up. The driver does not handle those dumpsters. He comes up and hooks up to them. If they're not out, they're not getting service. So, is there, unfortunately, is there a way that they could be notified 30 minutes before they arrive that it's so they can push their dumpsters out there and then move them back? And that, that's not according to the contract. The contract, Doc, if you want to call it the door, the stub is a uh, screen. It's not literally a um, garage type door so that the smells can be kept within the uh, loading dock area. It, it just comes out um, right past that, you know, onto the sidewalk area. And it's not, you know, if you're a person that's coming to this city as a tourist and you've got to walk by that stuff, it's not very pleasant. You know? and, and again, that would be something for the people that design and build Margaritaville. You know, we don't necessarily specify what garage door they use. They told us what they want to use, and we just have it through our process with planning development to approve what they I think that's where we, we, as, we, as maybe the CRA, we need to put together, there, as part of the uh, original vision plan, was that the CRA would put together some design standards for the city, for the downtown district. And I think we need to do that so that when developers come in here, they have an understanding and uh, an idea of what the expectations need to be and we can prevent some of these issues from occurring. Every time we do a building, we ought to learn from it and hopefully improve on the next one that we do. But there was a provision in there for the CRA to put together a uh, design standard and we don't have one, unfortunately. And, and I will say, for the record, Public Works recommended the uh, rebuilding of the 6th Avenue Street in as part of this construction um, to completely fix the parking issues, the turnaround issues, several other issues that are involved directly with that one. Somewhere in the lines of communication, that design uh, got scrapped and they were ultimately overlaid uh, what was existing in that 6th Avenue. So I'm, I'm in the way right now of, of proposing some alternatives for uh, the city to consider to be able to solve what was installed would not meet LDC today. I don't understand how it ever got pushed through there. There's a, a spot in the LDC that says you can't back out of traffic, back out onto a main thoroughfare. Well, what do we do when that parking lot's full? Back right out onto that main thoroughfare. So we're looking at several different options for that end. But one of the things we may be coming back to you at some point is authorizing the funds to completely rebuild that beach end the way it should have been built to begin with to be able to flow the water so that it doesn't sit on the Margaritaville side to extend the parking towards um, Casa Marina to take out the trees and do it right, what we, which is what we suggested. But somewhere along the lines, that all fell apart. And we've got to figure out whether that's the best option or it's just taking up the four spaces at the end and blocking them off so people can turn around, whether that's the best option for them to move ahead. Thank you, and definitely bring it back. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll keep you informed as best I can. That's why I said I was able to answer this question on the garbage, so I figured I might as well answer the question rather than just uh, leave it to come back this week in an email and, and go back. But I don't know when they're uh, compactor. I, I will uh, update that tomorrow. I'll get with our uh, sanitation supervisor, find out what the schedule is at, and I'll send it back to, to Mr. Graham so he can forward it out to everybody and let you know what that schedule is. I, we hope that'll solve some of the issues and problems with the garbage that they've got. I, I appreciate that, and I hope that Kate will take a closer look at the uh, trucks that are doing food deliveries at Margaritaville because they've got two or three trucks that sit in First Avenue, which is not in accordance with what was approved by City Council recently. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, so that's just real quick. Do we know how long their contract is with the picking up the bills for six months like that? Um, so well, give us a time frame. The, the garbage contract itself, the garbage contract runs until 22. So, so hypothetically, they could be dealing with this multiple little dumpster thing until 22. They, they've already ordered the compactor, but the compactor has to get built somewhere down south of Orlando somewhere. Then they got to bring it up. I know they've already got the electrical that wasn't even installed. So even if we had had the compactor available, they had no way equipped in their little black box drawn on a map of how to even operate that you know, right. unit. So they've already got the electrical upgrade completed from what I understand, and the design for the compactor is in play. It's just a matter of get it built and get it canceled. And then I have one last question, uh, Mr. Chandler. Sure. I can't quite recall, I believe, as much as we all feel Margarita built in our district, is can you even deal with them? Because I think they're just outside. Don't we end at 6 North? I thought we ended at 8. Yeah. eight, right? we ended eight. Yeah. For some reason, I thought we ended at 6. So they are inside our, our yes. district. They are definitely within us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just, oh, wait. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, yes. I'm a little confused. Is the contract with waste management, is that a city contract for commercial? <clears throat> yes. It's not, they don't have an individual contract. No. It's a city contract over the entire city for residential and commercial. So. That, that overall contract, I think, comes up next about a year, a little over a year from now before we are going to look at whatever we're going to do, whether that's an extension or a new RFP or whatever we're going to do for a process next year. Now we don't have like 20 people running around with a pickup truck with two arms in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Mr. Gilmore, new business. I would like to ask Mr. Barron. And Mr. Moore to come up to discuss the first item A, appropriation request for downtown improvement projects four and five. This will be an action item, as well as B, the appropriation request for South Basin Improvement Project Three. You've seen the information about this. I would say uh, Kale and Dennis have done a great job of getting us to this point where we can proceed with this. Uh, funds are fixed uh, after consideration and, and hopefully approval tonight will go to City Council at their next meeting, and then we're off and running. Mr. Barron. Um, so to kind of give you a short uh, briefing, we'll take these in two separate items. The first item is projects, what we call projects four and five, with uh, GAI as the contractor. Uh, we did go through a competitive bid process completely, uh, an RFP process for all available uh, engineering firms that wanted to do this. Uh, the committee narrowed that down. We had presentations, um, and then the committee had some discussions and kind of picked uh, who we had to do what based on the uh, the overall scoring that they did, as well as what they thought that, what we thought they could bring to the table as far as the, the quantity of work and the quality of work that we're expecting. So, GAI has uh, just completed uh, the most recent current downtown engineering um, process. So by being able to capitalize on the existing information they already had, uh, they were kind of picked to continue on with projects four and five, which involved the CRA, as well as project six, which I know is outside the CRA. Just to give you an overall, they have the next three phases of the downtown construction process as part of this award. Um, this would be the green light for them to go ahead and begin construction, or begin, sorry, to begin the design process. We expect this design process to take somewhere between uh, nine to 12 months before it's actually going to hit the field for construction. As part of that, there'll be community outreach, um, the ability, I believe, to put in uh, some feedback uh, on an internet site uh, to be able to collect um, additional data from people in the area. Uh, a, a phasing of this, we won't, I mean, as much as we'd like to say, we're gonna do project four, and then we're gonna do five, and then we're gonna do six, uh, we don't know that that's the best. What we've learned so far is that might not be the best. So uh, we're asking to kind of award all of this at once, then to kind of put together the best design and the design plan that they can do, bring it back to us at the 60% level, and then begin to have those community conversations. The idea, what we're thinking is uh, the route along first and second may be what we want to do first and foremost as one giant unit. So instead of like the last couple that you can have a piece now and then a piece in a couple of weeks and then a couple, three more weeks, and it seems like you're, you're constantly on one of those two streets, 
the opportunity might be there to, to do first street and get it all knocked out put it back in service do second street get it all knocked out then do the avenue sides to do all the connections and everything else they need to do we don't know that until they get through their process so this was actually uh, part of the um, scope and project that uh, Cale put together uh, dealing with GAI for this particular project. He can tell you more about that if you have any other further questions. Now, who handles the um, the public outreach part of it? Do you guys handle that or whoever wants the design? Whoever wants the project handles that? GAI will be as part of their project um, proposal was the ability to be able to do that as part of their project. So they will be coordinating all that piece. It'll, We'll probably link to their stuff to be able to collect data and whatever from what I understand on the website stuff. So. Yeah, and, and a big part of that is also uh, informing the public as we move along and then also it carries into uh, construction. We will make sure that you know, the public's informed of the phasing and when their block's going to be you know, compromised for, for you know, inconvenience in some way. Um, but we will, even though the consultant, and there's, there are fees in here for that, the consultant would be setting up, um, standing up that website and doing some, uh, uh, they have some time in for some landscape architects uh, to make that site interactive to the point of hopefully really eliciting you know some informative responses. And but we will be fully involved. It won't just be the consultants dealing with the public. We will certainly always be right there and available uh, to represent the city in that process. Yeah. Okay. So um, as I'm reading this and hearing what you're saying. For the couple of constituents who are very, very concerned what's going to happen to their corner of their particular condominium, um, they will get a chance to review um, concepts and provide input before everything is cast in stone. But yeah, absolutely, that that would primarily be at the uh, the public workshop. Um, I think you know, generally we. We're hoping for one public workshop, uh, you know, if we get into it and we have alternatives and have to bring them back, there might be flexibility, but that would be a public workshop. But, uh, you know, there will be an opportunity to see what the conceptual plan or issues are through this website along the way, um, hopefully in advance of that workshop. So they're coming already informed to some degree. Because, um, you know, if you have a diagram with the parking spaces and sidewalks already in place sometimes it's hard to change if there's some objections so you know I'm, I would just hope on, on their behalf that they'd be able to say well we've done this to our corner we'd like to preserve that can you move the sidewalk here or there that sort of thing well and that's the idea behind the 60 percent design process is so you're not having them commit to a 100 percent design ready to be built you send them uh, come they bring back to us a 60 percent design then they start having those meetings so we can address can that be done can that not be done can we do can we put angle parking does it need to be parallel parking what exactly can we do where we'll have people that say they don't want any parking at all we'll have people that insist they want parking in front so that's why we request that they do a 60% design and then have some meetings back with not just us, but the public as well. So they will kind of have a drawing to kind of say, hey, this is what we're thinking, but then that opportunity for individual input will be there. Not saying that every single thing everybody wants will be incorporated, but they'll at least be able to have their opportunity to speak and then see it and flush that out to say, yes or no, that will or won't work. Um, so that hopefully we can move ahead with a, a full design. Um, as at that 60 percent mark that's also where the phasing will begin and we'll start looking at splitting that design up a little bit more if it makes sense to do four and five together but yet hold off to do six and wait six or eight months to begin the design for section six just to kind of keep everything flowing depending on what the design comes out to say as they get there good that's what i was hoping you'd say thank you Here. It took me a while to get my arms around this. It was a little it's confusing at first well, because what I, is it, you know, you, you, there's two different pieces to this thing. One is the downtown projects, and then the rest is the um, stormwater studies and things to that extent. But when you look at the downtown thing, it keeps referring to the south end development area and so forth. And it, to me, it just got really confusing, but 
Well, I think, Gary, to help you clarify, what you're looking at, too, is since there was only one RFP, that's what well, I want. RFQ, the RFQ, the RFQ was that's for everything, and then we dissected it after that, which is kind of what makes it confusing and it makes it look like um, you've got two separate things. But what we did is ask, hey, throw us your best design, and then we chose two and dissected it back apart. So it's kind of weird because the, the RFQ part of it does have both of it, and it's all commingled. But yet now we split it back apart. It, it just took me a while to get my arms around that, but I appreciate that. Yes, the thing that the biggest uh, question I have is in reference to design schedule. In some cases, I saw that there was a design schedule that um, GIA or G, uh, GAI had, and then also the other firm, um, Jones Edmonds. Yes, they seem to have a schedule, but I think we really need to tie that down. And I want to make sure that we really hold them to that schedule, that if they've got several different pieces that they're doing with uh, each of their assignments, and I don't want, because you can't get something done on project two, you can't move forward on project three. You, you've got to be able to move all that stuff forward, and they can't have the excuse that all of the other stuff is what's holding us up. They've got to be able to move all of it forward, have the manpower and capability to get this effort done and get it done efficiently. And I hope you can, you know, get a good schedule for them from them so that we can uh, make sure this happens. The, the other side of the coin is, do you have the manpower and the staff to be able to follow through on all of these projects with everything going on basically simultaneously? And you know, if we don't, we need to make sure that we we get the manpower so that we move all of this forward very efficiently. Uh, so I'm gonna cut up what you kind of said there. So the GAI piece, which is what we're talking about now, versus the Jones Edmonds piece. The Jones Edmonds piece, because it's such a large section and it involves multiple waterways, multiple ways of moving storm water. The Jones Edmonds piece actually is not for design up front. It's for a complete study of all of the stormwater in that South Bend district, uh, how all that works to be able to put all those pieces together. At that point in time, they'll bring back to us the, uh, uh, the, the, the design criteria that they think this is what we think you should do. Some of these projects that are in the CIP and have been there's discussions amongst us internally that we don't know that they need to be done. So we hope that the study part of it will flush that out. So we do know that their timeline is a little bit more vague, but because they're actually just doing a study to begin with, that's going to kind of give us the parameters to come back and say, okay, now that you've got the study finished, this is the amount of money to move forward for design. And yes, we're on track with what you want to do as far as being able to, to, to do those um, actual design components for the stormwater and all the stormwater outfalls from the central basin to the southern basin to... Um, Is there a particular that. reason you divided it up the way you did between them? Um, we, we did that based on Jones Edmonds. It is paired up with um, Hansen to be able to do this. There are go-tos for everything stormwater. That seems to be very much their forte. And as part of, I was not part of the committee that, that chose the, the contractors. However, I did sit on and, and, and participate as far as listening to all of them. But at the end of it, I mean, the group, the committee themselves thought that GAI made the best sense to move ahead with the downtown because they've already got the experience, they've already got a lot of the data, and they did do an overall good job of the engineering piece for the downtown piece. So that made sense for them to continue ahead, and it made sense to really look forward to Jones Edmonds and Hanson to pair up um, as far as that stormwater piece. Um, also, in, in, you know, part of this thing is we've got a, a stormwater master plan that we're working on as well. So all this information they're collecting will ultimately lead into the stormwater master plan. So we're hoping by the end of the study, we're going to have some better ideas for design. By the time we get to design, we're going to have some better ideas so that we can bring back a lot more solid budget. What we've got floating around in the CIP, a lot is multiple projects. Some of them have been done, some of them haven't. We want to try to get that document cleaned up so that we know what our actual costs are going to be, what projects do we have to be. You guys are faced with uh, budget decisions, especially with this, this funding piece that you've got. And, and we've got some numbers that are five, six, seven, eight years old or more inside this budget document. 
you can't hardly make educated decisions as to what to do with extra financing until we can tell you what we need to be able to do for these projects. I, I totally agree with you. I, the reason I was just asking my question is like in the um, GAI proposal, I thought they did an excellent job of describing the stormwater issues that um, the city is you know, having to deal with. It was very well outlined and identified as to the considerations and issues that we need to be looking at as that we do this study. So I was just wondering you know, how it got split the way it did. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on item number A? Jim? Mr. Chairman, so you have before you resolution number A for the 2021-02, where the city of Jacksonville Beach would amend its downtown redevelopment district capital improvement program, and you would recommend appropriating $1,052,415.65 for the final design of bidding for the first project as discussed. Is there a motion? Is there any other questions on item number A? Just one other question. Yes, sir. Um, on item A, was also um, at least a reference in the documentation that I received about the, um, and, I, and I don't know, all these things are called different projects or phases, and I have a hard time keeping up with all of them, but there was a subsequent, a final phase that was going to be done. This project six, phase 3D, project six, it's not CRA. Will that be done at the same time by GAI? G GAI, that's the part that will go to City Council next week. So because this is not in the CRA, we can't include it in your documentation. But yes, when we actually present next next for two weeks to uh, the City Council, they will be approving the multiple funding for projects three, uh, four, five, and six. So you'll see this exact dollar figure plus another dollar figure of a little over half a million dollars, if I remember right for that design for Project 6. So yes, they've already been awarded that next phase of 6. Thank you. Any other questions on item number A? I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve um, the recommendation to um, provide for the um, tax increment trust funds in the amount of $1,052,415.65 for the infrastructure improvements outlined in RFQ 081920. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, and call the roll, please. David McGraw? Yes. Jared Patel? Yes. Jeffrey Jones? Yes. Francis Tobolsky? Yes. And Art Graham? Yes. Okay, item number B, Mr. Gilmore. Mr. Chairman, this is CRA Resolution 2021-03. It appropriates money from the Downtown Tax Increment Trust Fund in the amount of $255,706.34 and from the South Beach Redevelopment Trust Fund, $181,871.15. How you get those little pennies in there? It's amazing to me, but there you go. And this is to, as was discussed, based upon questions from Mr. Paytow for the preliminary study of Central South Basin improvements. Um, Mr. Gilmore, I think we have to have requested change in those dollar figures. Okay. Um, <laughs> only because. So. Uh, there's a there's actually a there's actually a city split um, to that that would probably probably want to do it at the study level um, and then uh, do you have some correct numbers you can give us so we can change it's a it's a it's a, it's a, it's a 65, 65 35, 35 split I can give you a map I think. anyway so I apologize for that we we, um, we were going through those numbers with finance. And that South Basin is, is all in the CRA. Well, the South Basin is all in the CRA, and then the discharge channel runs to the, um, the marsh. But there are areas that contribute to that basin that are not in the CRA. So we did a split before for um, Bill, man. We calculated that what that percentage would be using the stormwater basins and which percentage of the basins are inside the CRA and which are outside the CRA. 
and it's a 65 35 split so you're saying if i may that they should be appropriating how much from the downtown and how much from the South Beach. That's well, if you're the downtown, there's a split that's in the budget. The $255,000 number is accurate. From the downtown, so those numbers are correct, but there's a split that, that needs to make them. So, Do you have that without? I have what's up on the top. Mr. Chairman, is there a way we can have a few minutes to circle back on this resolution, the second resolution, so we can get our numbers correct so that you're actually voting on the correct numbers? We don't really want to table it tonight. We'd rather still have an opportunity, but if you can give us a few minutes, we can check our pencils in the back and we can come, we can bring this back up to you. Can you do that? Huh? Anybody actually do that? She, she's back there trying, <laughs> trying to do it right now. So I was going to say, because she's on the next one. All right, well, let's, we'll, let's get by. We'll go ahead and do the minutes. We'll take what that's right now. All right, guys. We have four sets of minutes. We need to approve CRA regular meeting. CRA regular meeting for January 25th. CRA workshop for February 10th. Uh, CRA special meeting for February 17th and CRA workshop for March 16th. If nobody's got any issues for any of those four, we can just take it in one big motion. I, nobody says they have any issues. Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Right of action you for approval, approval of all four sets of those minutes. Changes very happy with that. <laughs> okay, uh, we had one piece of old business. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman. The uh, incentive toolbox. We were all given that probably 90 days ago, 120 days ago, a while ago. And um, the city manager asked if we had officially accepted that as a as a group, as a board, and we never really voted on it. So I had to bring it back up to old business so we can vote on it. So then we can use the items in this toolbox as an organization. Mr. Chairman, if I may, yes, sir. As it relates to the city toolbox, those are examples we can use now. They are not totally exclusively. Uh, we always reserve the right to come up with new additional ideas that can serve as incentives to meet our, our objectives. So, we need to approve this toolbox. Does anybody have any questions about the toolbox? Any concerns? Just general statements? Francis? Anybody? It's been moved and seconded. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? I don't see any lights on. Madam Clerk, if I get you a call to roll, please. David Nagel? Yes. Jeffrey Jones? Yes. Francis Pawlowski? Yes. Gary Paytag? Yes. And Art Graham? Yes. All right, you're actually you have accepted the official toolbox of the CRA. Okay, so minutes are done. Mr. Chairman, we may talk about black racks or the annual report. Uh, let's talk about the annual report because that's something we have to have done. Uh, Chandler, what time do we have to be out of here today? I'm sorry, your discussion. There's no follow-up meetings. Okay. Um, let's talk about the annual report. The annual report, four statutes require the completion of the annual report, report in relation to appropriate agencies by March 31st of every year. In the past, we have discovered that that report was simply prepared and then delivered to you. This year, we are giving it to you, and I recognize that because of the time, you haven't had a chance to examine it and look at it. In effect, it includes the financial statements, the 
financial status, what that's required to do. It also required us to go back and look at all the actions that the redevelopment agency took during this past year for inclusion in the report as well. So we give this to you and we would like you to consider accepting it and then, but I would enjoy the opportunity to come back and discussing this with you at the next meeting when we can talk about the accomplishments and I can list what you have done. But for today, we would like you to accept it. What happens by us accepting it? And we can still make changes to it. We can still the March 31st deadline. Or okay. So we've met the March 31st deadline. So do we have to vote to accept it? So what? it'll go to city council and yes. it has to be posted online by the 31st. That's, That's all. That's it's simply line. provided for information on the So we we have to vote that we received it and accept it. Yes, sir. But I think there's two different things you're saying. Because if we receive it, it's one thing. If we accept it, then we're accepting it. <laughs> I understand that difference. Okay, we talked about 
getting rid of the property. Um, we're going to go back to item B. Sincerely apologize for that scramble of numbers, but I would much rather do be approving the proper financial request, uh, especially before we get to city council in two weeks and discover that we've got a we've got a message to approve something. So the dollar figures that are actually in the memo, I have not changed. The difference is the amount that the CRA is responsible for versus the amount that the city is responsible for for each of those two figures. So the updated numbers, where are we looking? Uh, the second page of the memo? The memo or the second page in this particular case for 2021-03, the resolution. Yeah, this, this would be a, an update of the resolution 2021-03. So the dollar figures for the $255,706.34 in the downtown portion, that would be split with an 82.73 versus 17.27% split. And what that equates to is the CRA is responsible for $211,546. And the city will then subsequently be for the balance, which would be forty-four thousand one hundred and sixty dollars. No sense. Uh, Miss Gossett was informed us to go ahead and round the sense away, so we don't have to mess with those. Thank you, Miss Gossett. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then the second portion, which is the south end portion, which the total is one hundred eighty-one thousand eight hundred seventy-one dollars and fifteen cents. That is a 65-35% split based on the land area and the amount that it feeds. So what that equates to is the CRA is responsible for $118,216. And the city will then be responsible for $63,655. So we will be updating our memo to the city council as well as um, those are the current updated numbers for resolution 2021-03. So, I, I apologize also, um, and um, I explained the split for the south end and the split for the downtown basin, the central basin, is, is similar, and that was calculated during the original, I believe during the original design or plan and study for that downtown area, and it factors in, I believe, primarily uh, Project 6, but the portion of the downtown, the additional portion of flow through the central basin of the downtown improvements and then that split between the CRA and the non-CRA area of that. And that's been in the budget for a while. So what I'd like to do through Jim uh, is make sure he has the, the page in the budget that shows that number and the map that shows the south end CRA, provide that to you separately. So you have to have that. That's not the one that shows, the, it's a different map that shows okay. the, how much of the percentage? I'm sorry to take you in the weeds. I just want to make sure that you guys have that so you understand what those numbers are. So it, it just shows that we can support those percentages. One of the, the original percentage in the downtown was something that's already been figured out and it's been in the CIP for a lot of years. And then the second set, we have documentation to show that 6535 wasn't just a, an arbitrary number that we just pulled out to say this is the split. But we actually have um, an agreement that explains that between us and finance as to what that actual split is and why we got there. Okay. So we're on item B. Francis. I'm ready to hear. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the appropriation of funds for the Central and South Basin improvements at 211546 and 118216 um, it's been moved and seconded. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, call the roll, please. David McGraw? Yes. Gary Kato? Yes. Jeffrey Jones? Yes. Francis Wolowski? Yes. And our grand? Yes. If I have to use a proof, I don't want to be beat. I don't want to be I don't have an I don't have food here. So we're going to talk about COVID-19. <laughs> Francis. Can I just ask a quick question before you guys head out? Um, yeah. They're safe with my grant. Oh, they are. Okay. So we, um, we 
Steve back in February spoke about the art lighting um, stuff that's supposed to be um, given to us, an update was supposed to be given to us. And I know everything else has been kind of like. What was your question about which part? The art lighting for our downtown area. Remember when we were going through the our nets? Said that we used to do the art lighting furnishings and all that. I know we're doing the rising wall and all that, but they, they, can, they can talk about the site furnishing in just a minute. As it relates to the lighting stuff, I've asked to set a meeting with Beaches Electric so I can sit down with them because they're actually in charge of that process and I'm trying to get that done next week. In terms of the art master plan, that is very complex. And we have met with the Cultural Council of Duval County and with another lady who worked there that lives at the beaches and I've asked them to give us a process paper of how that would work for your, for your consideration because the selection of art involves artists, it involves community input, where's it going to go, what's it going to look like, and it's a whole complex process, but, so, but I will let you know that we have done that. We've reached out and talked to both of those groups and requested process papers to give to you for consideration so we can think the best way to move on the art master plan. So a couple of years ago I gave Bill um, a name and all that, the person who runs the Jacksonville one who's doing all the different parts there. Thank you very much. I just wanted to follow up before. And in both of those meetings were very, very good. We, we being Taylor and I, were very impressed with their professionalism and how they go about it to make sure there's, there's community input and everything from the type of art, to selection of the artists, to selection of final pieces, all the way down the line. Okay, thank you. Ashley, item number six. Mr. Gilmore, if you want to use this up. I'm going to simply turn it over to Ashley on that, you have received the uh, memo from her on the financial statements and then the auditor's report this year ending September 30th, 2020, the downtown and south and redevelopment districts. Okay, so this is the first draft of the we have ever produced independent financial statements for the tax increment districts. So this is part of a state statute change uh, effective for 2020. So these documents are completely unique. Um, in the past, the CRA financials were included as part of the city's financial statements and comprehensive annual financial report because the CRA is a dependent special district of the city. The numbers will continue to be recorded in the city's financial statements, but going forward, we will have an independent report for each uh, tax increment district. And part of the reason the states required this is they want some assurances that um, we have descriptions of what's being deposited into the TIF funds and what's being withdrawn from them for each year, that the um, financial statements identify the assets and liabilities, and that they also make sure that the districts are in compliance with the state statute 163, 37, section 6 and 7 regarding the review and appropriations. Um, our external auditors issued an unmodified opinion, which is the highest level of insurance that you can receive for financial statements. Um, if you have any questions on any of the numbers, I'm happy to go through them with you. Um, there, the numbers are a little bit different than what we had appropriated in October because in October we're still going for the annual approval process. So the fund balance numbers you saw in October are slightly different, but these are your audited final numbers. So with that, I'm available to answer any questions you can have. Any questions for Ashley? And you can always contact me if you have questions later. Hey, Gary. Actually, just a minor question. In the letter that the auditors wrote, they talk about corrected and uncorrected misstatements. They said that everything was cleared up. But what, what do they mean by those minor trivial things? Can you give me an example or two? So there is nothing with regard to the CRA. Um, there's nothing that needed to be corrected, but I will tell you with our financial statements in 2019 for the city, because we were going through an ERP conversion process, we were delayed in completing some more quarters and we were delayed in our bankrupts. And so in 2020, they came back and said, yes, your bankrupts are completely current and you made progress with your work orders. So that's something that might come up on audit, um, but for the CRAs, everything is but just it, but this is the letter in reference to yeah. the CRA and it specifically says that there were some items but they were corrected and then 
so there must have been something that had to be done ultimately. So a lot of that is boilerplate-like language and the communications with those charged with governance. A lot of the statements in there are used in each and every letter that they issue. I'm sorry, so they So the, the language and the communications with those charged with governance is boilerplate language, and so a lot of the statements that they make are kind of required to be made of the auditor. Thank you. That's all I have. Any other questions, concerns, thoughts? Mr. Guma, do we have to receive this? Do you wish that? Um, so since this is the first time we're doing it, I wanted to find a way that we could memorialize it with the agency. So I thought bringing it to you as a memo for you guys to formally accept is a way for us to kind of put it in our record that these statements were delivered to the agency and then they will be submitted to the Auditor General. So therefore, Mr. Chairman, per Ms. Gossett's recommendation, she would like a motion that the agency has accepted and received the auditor's reports. Just received. There's only one in here. I can't because I don't have it. Although I didn't get an email with it, I saw I can't say I accept I received it. Is it online? Yes, it was posted online and it was in the email. Yeah, I, I, I printed everything I saw by email, but this I haven't received, so I printed everything I had, so I can't say I received it. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion. <laughs> that we um, accept and have received the financial statements of the independent auditor's report for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2020 for the downtown and south and redevelopment districts. Since I read it, I will second it. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none? I um, don't like a copy of it. Sure. Um, Madam Clerk, we get you to call the roll. David McGraw? Yes. Uh, Jeffrey Jones? Yes. Gary Paytown? Yes. Francis Kowalski? I guess I'll say no since I didn't get it. I'll just say yes because I'll get it. And Art Green? Yes. Well, you're asking you for approve the motion. Uh, a text, actually, a good thing this came up the time it did. Guys, I can't, fun I can't function unless I get this in a notebook. I'm not one of those guys who reads it online. I'm not one of those guys. I mean, you can see I use old campaign letterhead <laughs> to print it because I, I don't have the ink capacity. I don't have all that stuff. We do, we do have enough in the budget for professional services. There's no reason why we can't just send this to an office depot or something on that line and have it printed and delivered. Very good, sir. We'll do it. And if we need to, and as I've been told all the time, have something as a group decision. If somebody may actually, if someone wants to make a motion to, for that effect, I can't make a motion. <laughs> I, I'll make a motion to uh, request that all um, meeting materials distributed in advance to CRA members be provided in printed form. I'll second that. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. I know all the time people say, well, you need to know exactly how everybody feels. Now we all know. Okay. Let's move on to last thing on the agenda is bike rides. Yes, sir. And I have a couple of recommendations as it relates to a couple of things on this subject. It leads, leads into another one. The city has now actually entered and has issued the purchase order to Dix Hike to begin the work on the bike rides back racks and side furnishings I made available after the workshop, the work that you you brought forth, uh, Francis, and gave it to everyone in public works on that with some other ideas. And our thoughts are is that we would have Dix Height and Cody come here as soon as possible because it's the concept about themes is a good one. The talk of the, the concept about what type of bike racks go where is important because Bike racks have to take into consideration where they are on the street, so there's no interference with traffic and flow, and there could be different types of bike racks. So I'm suggesting to you that we not 
expeditiously, I think is the word that Mr. Paytai used earlier, but that has dicked tight in, in their design over the last several years. Well, for the most part, everything that he has was pretty much those rings that we have out by the side of the, the new parking lot. I think they're actually, what they have in there are actually different rings than that. They're more, they're just, I, I, if I remember, so the rings, uh, those have like, a, they're small rings with a, like a U in the middle of them. I think these were just big circles, arcs. They're called arcs. And it's, they're big circles. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't tell you how, how it progressed and ended up with those. Uh, the document about a year before that had a few different styles in there, and now he has the rings. He can, you know, hopefully he will be able to speak to how it got there. He is not, his expectation is not that he's charging full speed ahead with those arcs. Um, so I think we, we just want to make sure we figure out the best way to freshen that design up with what the CRA would, you know, what the vision is now, because I don't think it's, doesn't sound like it's the arcs. Well, looking at the website that did those silver rings or stainless rings, whatever rings they are, by the new park, I'm sorry, by the new parking lot, they have theme bike racks. And for the most part, those things are long and linear, mm -hmm. or they're big and round. And so I guess the question to him would be, the, all the locations he's currently got for bike racks, if they can fit both the long and linear and the big and round, then say so. If they can only fit the long and linear, then say so. If they can only fit the big and round, then say so. And so each one of those would be designated long and linear, big and round. Uh, I just want to make sure that you don't have an idea of certain ones that you're expecting to see. So I will have examples of different types if somebody doesn't have specific ones that they want to see and whether or not he can fit them. So yeah. We're not there at that point. But, but when he shows up, if he can just, if he can just tell us, you know, I've seen this this intersection, or I've seen this spot, and you can't do the big and round there. You can okay. only do linear. And we can decide which of the six linear ones they have, if it's going to be a dolphin or a shark or something else. So we those can, are from a different manufacturer than he spec. Those are from, like, you know, Mad Racks instead of Dura. So that's what I want to, so I can turn. I can so he did not do Mad then? He did not. He okay. specified Dura, which was the art, the stainless steel art, D-E-R-O, I believe. So, uh, so, like I said, I can't say how it got to that point, that's where it is. So, I can communicate to him that, show him the Madrax and say they're, they're looking at some alternatives like this if they fit in some of those locations and factor that into uh, kind of another alternative and, and present that to you to say this style would work here, this style wouldn't work here because bikes would stick out in the street and you need this style um, using a you know, some other alternatives like the Mavericks. So I, I, I can't speak for these other four people. Let's hear from them. Francis, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So, that original plan was never really approved. Those were concepts. Um, I agree with Art that it should come with, here's a map, these are the designated areas we think the bike rack should be at. And then they need to, we need to know the size of the space that we can fit what we want to know. I also, across the board, I do believe we should have a consistent base rack for people with designated, you know, clean places. So that's what we would possibly discuss. So for me, with him, him coming, I would expect, I'm going to set my expectations, I would expect that he has given us a map. These are the locations that we're recommending. These are how big the spaces are. And by the way, here are some themed options for you as far as a catalog per se, or these are some base ones. Because that's just what I would expect at this point. Um, that's just what I would expect mm -hmm. that needs to be. Okay, and so then, that, And does it take a step further back? I don't know if it, it's good. It, that, well, that's for me. So he has a map. Of where the bike racks are proposed to go. Does it include that is just finished my sentence? So does it include certain areas that may are questionable are like bricks and bricks. They have those bike racks and bricks. They technically look like they're in the alleyway, but I think they belong to bricks. Does the map include those that are questionable where they're located? In the alleyway. So in bricks, they have the you know, here's the bricks itself and then they have their parking lot. 
their actual bike rack look like they're in the alleyway, not necessarily part of their property. I don't believe they're in the alleyway. So like, that's the kind of thing that I didn't know if that would include, because then maybe we do our incentive things. We can talk about that later, but like. They're, they're, they're they're maybe it's an alley and not our. I think what we have to be very, very careful of is what we've approved, what you have approved for Dix Height to freshen up this design versus redesign. So I've heard you throw out, we want four different themes. If, if, we, if you want us to proceed back to Dix Height to go with four different themes, somebody has to give us that. You can't expect us to go back and say, these are the themes and here's where we think they should be, because that's not really what we do. That's what the design I'm not saying that. So my concern is, so I've reviewed quite a bit of this already to see, and I know a lot of the rings are designed to be in line with parking and traffic along First Street. A linear bike rack will literally make you face the bikes the other direction, and your walkways will be obstructed as well as your roadways. So I know if you're if reviewing this, there's going to be some of those exactly what uh, Mr. Graham requested is, we don't recommend changing these. They need to be a ring or they need to be a flat design like the, like the Mad Rex has in the Flamingo or one of the other designs if that's what needs to be put in there. So I think, I think he can do partially what you're asking for what he's agreed to as far as his redesign or freshening up of the design. We just have to be very careful what we're asking of him to do because if we're actually asking him to redesign what we have here, he is going to probably make a request to reallocate a budget amount that says if we're going to crack this open and redesign and I'm going to assess set spaces and we're going to have themes and we're going to go through this, that's starting all over because the whole package of Dick's height, including the furnishings, including the site furnishings, including the art, including all that other stuff was kind of one big giant theme package. So when we start tearing apart individual pieces of this, it may not fit with the overall as we bring forward. So the next time, as, as Mr. Gilmore requested with the arts piece, the arts plan that we have drawn, and then we start putting bike racks where we think they might fit, and you guys agree that that's where they fit, they might not correspond then with the artwork plan that's coming in behind us. So we have to be just very careful with that, and our request to Dick's height, because what they've agreed to financially in our scope is to freshen up this, but not redesign it. Not saying they won't redesign it, I'm just saying to try to set the expectations. If Cody starts requesting additional funding because we're requesting redesign, we'll have to begin this process back over again, come back in front of you to apportion some additional funds for redesign while we let him do it. I do think he'll be able to accommodate what you've asked, potentially. I haven't, I don't know these plans well enough to know whether uh, the couple of designs that have been poked out will even fit at all in here. I know a lot of them were a lot of the bike racks, there's were there 100, over 100 bike racks in here. And you take out the pier parking and just push it. So a lot of those were designed 100 rings. So while you might have two rings between you know, some parking or planters and then two more rings beside planters, those might have to remain in some sort of a linear fashion as opposed to a perpendicular fashion, which is something like the shark or the dolphin or whatever, simply because of the way the bikes are going to lay with traffic walkways and traffic as far as vehicle traffic. So I just want to make sure that we don't get too deep in with trying to redesign it because I'm afraid that that's going to put the brakes on and then we're going to be waiting for your next CRA meeting to come back and rediscuss redesign costs as opposed to just tweaking what we have. Okay. So but we want to get you what you want. I mean, that's... <laughs> Since I still have a floor, um, just bear with me, guys, for just a minute longer. Um, so I get that. I respect that. I understand that. Um, I understand that in the diagrams, that may, they may suggest certain directions for your bikes to be parked. I, I get that. So what I would like, though, is I'd like in that meeting, like Art said, give us an idea what will fit in certain areas, and then bring your catalog of creative ideas that fit along with the stuff that I provided earlier. And I only make that plea to you because this is the very first project that we fought and fought and fought for with City Council who could have easily taken it away from us to get it done right. And there is many people, there are a lot of people on that board who don't want just plain round circles. They want like some kind of variation. Now, I agree, some base 
across the whole city makes sense to make people care, but we should focus on targeting. That's what we can discuss later. But this meeting with him is tell us what we can do, or you're proposing what kind of thing. So that's what I'd like. I'd like to have here's what kind of things you should have in this area, and we can pick and choose what we would do as far as things, but we need to have an option to catalog to do so. That's okay. what I'm saying. I just wanted to make sure that when we discuss the <coughs> Cody, because what I got when you started talking about multiple themes and what I kind of got me an idea was. I need to know how big and what direction so we can find something that fits those parameters. Okay. And, and if I may, um, a part of this is also the site furnishings. So I was, I think there was a disconnect on what I was given and led to believe was ready to be constructed. Um, and, and I assume that applies to the site furnishings as well. So uh, I don't know if you've even looked at that or have options for alternatives to the bollards and to the waste disposals or, you know, if I should ask Cody to, see, should, should he maybe bring some options that might go with the style of the bike racks that you're looking at now. See, it's, I assume they kind of did this as a cohesive design, maybe they didn't. So. Are you okay with all the other stuff? You just want to look at different options for bike racks? I, I, I don't know. It, it sounds like we're... I don't think it matters to which, which catalog you shop out of. The one reason why I, I went to the one I did is because basically I looked at the, the rings that were there and, and found a manufacturer you know, website and just pulled those up. I mean, if there's another one that they use, I'm, well, I don't think anybody really cares about that. They just want some theme options. But, you know, but, and I'm some, asking theme options for the garbage receptacles the bottles, the planners. I mean, I, I mean, I, I just want to know how far it goes because when he comes here and, and he talks to you about the bike racks and then the bottles and then, you know, the expectation are we kind of looking at all of this again? Or maybe for some of us for the first time. I don't know, but I, I just, the expectation is changing. Well, when we were talking about this, Jim was saying that there was something going off the bottles before there were City manager's going to come back. City manager wants to get the bottom stuff. Yeah, so. And that can be included as far as this, this side furniture package is doing right now. That's what we're talking about. It is included. It is included. But Mr. Chairman, if I may. Hold on a second. I'll get to you. Sorry. David. No. Okay, Peter. I, I'm, I'm not, maybe not the only one, but I wasn't around during the time that this design was done. All of the, the site furnishings, the bottles, the bike racks, and there's also signage that's part of all of this that ultimately needs to be wrapped into it. I don't, I don't know, you know, I'm sorry, but I'm going to pull it back a little bit, but, you know, maybe it's time to relook at all of this one time, and are we, do we have a scheme, a design that makes sense for the downtown district? Do we know what direction we're going from a design perspective? I mean, to, to go back and ask the consultant to uh, come up with another bike rack is just changing a specification. It doesn't change the design. It's just saying, you know, give us some locations where you can put something unique or a little bit different, put it in the spec as an option, and so when it goes out to bid, the bidders can, can bid for it, and, you know, we make a choice when, when the prices come back. It's not that difficult to do. We're not talking about design changes, but in order that we all get on the same page as to where we're going, I mean, how do we get to that point? Right now, it's bits and pieces of things is what I'm hearing. And, I would uh, think to answer part of your question, too, is you almost have to hammer that down into design. Um, you know, because anybody who we have bid on this, they're not going to know how many sharks and dolphins and octopuses and whatever else you want unless they're specifically called out in here. So I get the idea of saying we'll put alternates in and we'll pick and choose when we get to that point, but you're, you're, you're right. kind of really steering the, 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 the bidding group is it can be all over the place when it comes to I'm, the I'm, I'm saying exactly that. It will define where they go to be. Give us a couple of places where you can put something different and unique dimensionally work and so forth. Okay. And we can just spec something else for those locations. That doesn't take him more than 10, 15 minutes to do, in my opinion. Um, I've gotten some feedback from others within the city that, um, you know, they're not excited about the round um, bike racks. 
So they would really like to see something different. And I don't know where we go from here if others are asking for, you know, changes to be made to the design, but somehow we've got to find a clear path there to get to, uh, to an end. And uh, I'm not sure I have a good suggestion for you at this point, but. The only thing I can suggest is we, we will, now that we have a PO officially issued to Cody, that's kind of been less the delay in having anything that was issued today. It's very hard for him to come back in and conceptually start making changes to something when he doesn't have anything in his hand and say he says he's got the job and he's getting paid. So he has that information. Now we can go forward and try to make a meeting with Cody, have him review what we have to see what can make alternates what can be done. We can show him what, I've, I've seen the choices that have been flown our direction. I don't have any problem sharing that with him and see if there's something he can incorporate as part of this process. Don't have an issue with that at all. I just wanted to make sure we're understanding the expectations so that, you know, I mean, there's, there's a nice big place for a nice big bike rack right in front of City Hall. Is that the one you want to be the big dolphin or do we want to wait until we, do we want to leave that with something different? That's why I say a lot of this is going to be Yes, it might fit here. Then do we want to bring, is that what you want brought back to you? Say, on page three, you have a choice. You can put five rings or you can put one dolphin. Yes. That's your choice. Yes. Okay. Uh, we will work with Cody. We will get that meeting set internally, and then we'll get a meeting set with Mr. Gilmore as to when we can get him in to be able to come back and do that. And if he can't come in, we'll come in with those same recommendations that you're making off of these existing plans. I just want to make sure that we have the expectations. We're doing what you want to do and not spending time trying to do things that you don't want to do. Hold on, I just want to say that, Jeff. Yeah, I'm, I'm, my memory may be faulty on this, but I'm sort of with Francis. I thought we had approved a concept um, that they should proceed with to come up with the final plan, not that we had approved the final plan. Um, you know, because I've been, you know, waiting to see something so we can get some input on it. So I was told the right, 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 right. right. so we were, we were, we were doing a Yeah, and on the site furnishings, the best I can recall is, well, we're going to come up with something that, you know, provides places for people to sit but not sleep. And that was it. That was it. Yeah. Um, you know, was, there's a lot of different styles and you know, levels of functionality and stuff. I don't remember, you know, approving a, a specific site furnishing plan. Unfortunately, I can say I've been here 15 months. We, we received a phone call five months ago asking if we could pour a couple sidewalk sized pieces of concrete and put in a couple bike racks. And now we've inherited it all. So that's why I say we're, we're as dear in the headlights as you are all too because we have not been involved in this entire plan since its inception. We got a phone call asking to put in a couple of pieces of concrete and a couple of bike racks, and then we said, Mr. Mr. Moore said, this is way bigger than that. And that's when we, we went back to Dick's Height to, to re-engage them to be able to do this. So yeah. I don't know what you want to do or how you want to begin. I have to well, defer to you, Mr. Chairman. You guys got the marching orders as far as the bike racks go right now. Just see if you can't set up a kind of a workshop with him and he can look at the current design, the different spots that we have, okay. and to see what options we can put in each one of those different spots. Perfect. And if he's got a manufacturer that he works with, that he's, that he's got comfortable with, and that works for us, just like it just launches some sort of nautical theme. And I mean, he's a design guy, he should just love this stuff. So you, you've appropriated the funding for this design, and you've appropriated the funding for the site furnishings, which includes the seating and the planners, and what, and the so, bollards, do you want us to have him hold off on looking at that at this time, or do you want us to move full speed ahead on everything that's in that plan? In what, what did um, City Member say about the seating and the bollards? You said something about the bollards. He's interested in doing something with the bollards. We've all seen that they're in great state of disrepair and need to be fixed. And there's there's no discussion about that he wanted. I don't think so. I, I think they're included in this plan. They're so included in that Dix High plan yeah. type of bollard that's there. Some will be lit, some won't be lit, but it's a standard type of bollard that at least his desire was let's make it uniform throughout the entire downtown area. And if he's going to be here for probably a two hour workshop, have him look at both. Okay. 
Okay, and then we'll, we'll address that. At okay. a minimum, uh, at a minimum, I will make sure that you know, he, he's the one that can speak to how he feels like these were presented and present them again and move on, move forward. Okay. Yeah. If, if it's the fact that you don't feel like you've seen these, then, then we need to get these in front of you. To, I mean, to make sure you've all seen them, had time to look at them. If there is any additional tweaking or whatever, we need to probably know that before we're appropriating funds for moving ahead. Um, just as we go through, because I know there's four or five different components to this, and we've only started with the first two, and we're already getting off track and, and away. So we need to make sure that we're before maybe before we're appropriating, we need to review these next pieces. And if that is uh, an art plan, like you said, then we just start from the beginning, act like we've never seen the material before, present it, and then move forward with it, rather than bringing things to appropriate that we think you've seen. And there's some concern of whether you have or have not. Yeah. To give you an example, um, and this is part of the site furnishings, a subject that's been near and dear to my heart is the trash receptacles on Third Avenue versus Second Avenue. And I've been waiting for it seems years to get see what they're going to be proposing. And then now I'm hearing, well, they've got the plan, and we. If you want us to go back and change the plan, then we're going to have to re rebid something. When I've been waiting to see what the plan was for since I think 2015. So I, there's something is a little amiss here, Mr. If I may, what I will have done, I'll speak with someone about this. I'm going to get printed a copy of the Dix High plan so that you've got it in front of you and you can look at it that was received and reviewed by the agency at some point. I don't know when. Actually, you have a copy of it. I was going to bring that up. Um, you guys have been marching orders for those two things. Actually, if I can get you to come up here for a second. Yeah, I thought that was just the concept that we were going to work for. That there wasn't specific here or there. I think the very first book that everybody, that I think you had, was the concept that's right and then i think these have been the divided down into these are the actual individual plans dissected down and ready for action I yeah and know. we have not seen those i'll put on record that i've been on the agency for almost nine years now and i've never seen anything other than that book actually you heard us earlier we talk about funding a third party to print copies and give us things. Is there anything else we need to do to make that happen? Uh, in this year's budget, the 2020 budget, we set aside some additional monies for professional services. And so the funding is available, and we, I can work with Jim and staff to find a way to make sure that you get, if I'm hearing correctly, you want printed um, agendas in advance of each meeting instead of the PDF copy. Now, everybody may be different than I am. I know specifically that I need to have one. Some people may be just as fine doing electronically, and Jim or Terry can reach out to each individual on their preference. But I've got the book. You may, you may want to reach out yeah. to have yeah. find out how much we have. I just want to make sure that we're not having this conversation next meeting, that because we didn't officially do something. Sure. Okay. Yeah. We'll make it happen. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Gilmore, do we have anything else on our agenda? Well, I would like, sir, to discuss another workshop. Okay. Because we're moving forward to budgets and other things that we need to do in terms of talking actually for next year's budget. Okay. And I'm building on something that has come from members of the agency, as well as from discussions with uh, uh, public works, finance, planning, and parks and rec where we would have a conversation to talk about, okay, what do we want to do with the South End? And what else do we need to do downtown? What can we put up on our wall and start talking about how we come up with actual ways and means to deliver based on input from here and input from the professionals that work for the city? And that's something I'd like to suggest you consider doing uh, as well. And were you going to suggest a day for a workshop? I can throw it April 5th, 14th, which is a Wednesday. Jeff, is it you cannot do Wednesdays until after tax day? 
Um, no, the, my last Wednesday session is over, so now we've switched to Saturday. So I'm good on Wednesday. Wednesday what? The, the 14th. Does that work for everybody? Works for me. Okay. Dennis, is that good? You make it happen, we'll make it happen. Good. Don't, don't clutch around our shit. I'll make it work. I'll, I'll change the appointment. You sure? Yeah, I'll change the appointment. Okay, so, uh, Chandra, can we get this room from like 5 to 7? On what day? I think we're 14th. It's currently open. I'll confirm with the clerk's office tomorrow, but it should be 99% tentative. Okay. So we just scheduled the next workshop. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, fine. Five five. And Mr. Chairman, we will wait till we hear from Cody at Dick's Height. We should be fluid on setting that up, but we know we want that as soon as possible as well. That's correct. Thank you, sir. But the 14th is going to be budget, right? Yes. Well, it's going to be. Cool. Yes. Lots of things. Well, you will reach out to us at least a week in advance. There's no question. We'll, we'll establish the we'll, we'll establish jointly the agenda for that meeting with the uh, public, the, the city professionals, and, and communicate to you all too, so we've got a complete agenda of everything that we're going to talk about. I actually feel like we got something done today, <laughs> and we'll do our best to see if, if we can get Cody here. But without speaking with him yet, we can't guarantee that he can be here for that workshop. But we'll. I think I'm, I'm thinking about two separate workshops. It's up to you. You guys are good. Huh? You can do this whenever he's done this break. Guys, thank you all for your time and patience. I know. Mr. Payton. I just want to make sure I understood that the workshop is going to have what I'm here to do. I want to discuss and have a complete meeting with the professionals from the city and with you and the agency on items that many of you have mentioned about what else do we need to do in the South End, what else do we need to do in downtown, what do we have on the books now, what do we need to do to augment, and it comes back to that portion we got money to spend, what can we spend it on, what do we need to do, how do we amend the plan, how do we get all of that working. So does, does that mean that um, it is part of the plan, the ultimate plan that we're going to have for the South End to address the City Council requests that we have a plan modified next year. Yes, so it's the beginning discussion of that. Thank you. Guys, I want to thank you all for your patience. I, I know I, I didn't expect this meeting to go as long as we did, but I'm glad we did what we did. And um, that all being said, there's a brand new gavel here. We're adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>